thank you. Okay, so thank you all for staying for the graveyard shift. The last day, the last hour on a conference, I know, is not always the most enjoyable. But hopefully, I've got a couple of things to show you that you're going to enjoy and get some value out of. Um, and there might be some repetition in, in terms of some of the stuff you've seen over the last few days. I apologize in advance, but I think if there is repetition, then we might be onto something. So, and there might be some repetition in, in terms of some of the stuff you've seen over the last few days. I apologize in advance, but I think if there is repetition, then we might be onto something. So, can you see that? Okay, so my name's Angus Robinson. Um, I'm head of mobility and innovation at Native, which is a digital marketing agency of about 100 and 180 people or so based here in uh, Johannesburg and in Cape Town. And I've got to go through four things pretty quickly um, in the 20 minutes uh, allotted time. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about in terms of innovation is uh, enterprise-driven innovation. So how can enterprises innovate in organizations that are typically not geared for innovation? Large, structured, uh, bureaucratic, admin-intensive, risk-averse organizations, how can they innovate? Um, and the one key thing is that companies realize, are starting to realize that what they have is they've got large reach and large customer bases, they have got financial muscle and marketing um, uh, a, a reach, um, and they've got, in some cases, the appetite to start innovating. Does anyone know who, what this company is, Mondelez? Does anyone know what brands they own? Anyone? 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 Who? Craft, yes. So it's Craft's uh, snack business. So they own our favorites, like for the ladies, the, the Lindt, no, sorry, the Milka and Dairy Milk and Toblerone. Um, so, and also firm favorites like, like Oreo. And they have launched this amazing project called Mobile Futures. And what that did was it said to the market, we want to innovate, but we cannot innovate from within at the pace that we need to. We all know that um, technology is accelerating at a pace faster than people, that businesses can keep up. So what do they do to try and keep up with that? Um, they also needed to try and understand the emerging trends in, in app development, in how um, uh, innovation takes place. Um, and th they launched this program um, earlier this year. They focused on three different things for the Mobile Futures um, program. One is the terrible acronym SOLOMO, which is social, location, and mobile. The next was looking for social TV. How can uh, they innovate around um, television programming and the second screen device and making TV more social? And the last one was mobile and retail. So how can they innovate around um, mobility at the point of purchase? They began in October last year with a call for, for new ideas, which drew in 126 entries. Um, that's then got narrowed down to 22, and then nine survived that final cut. And what they did, they then paired each of their, like their uh, um, large brands. So Stride, Gum, Oreo, our favorite uh, biscuits, Chips Ahoy, Trident Gum Halls. They then paired those with some of the winners from that Mobile Futures campaign. So, um, one of the examples was Waze. Now, who knows Waze? Well, most of you guys know Waze. It's a crowdsourced traffic uh, and a navigation system that was b built literally by the users. And what they did is they paired Stride, which was one of their guns, with Waze. And as you see at the bottom, it says Stride will be partnered with Waze to offer real-time um, specials to Waze's, people that use Waze, for uh, Stride gum. So as you're using Waze and you are um, going past a retailer that has got that, um, that, that is uh, partnered with, with uh, Mondelez and with Stride, you can get some, some great offers. Now you might think, oh, well, they could have done that internally pretty easily. But one of the key things is that this was a three-month project in which it wasn't just a case of come and pitch your idea and then do it. It got the marketing managers and, and channel managers, media people, to work with the innovators from Waze. And what, that's really important because it helps teach them how to operate in a much more nimble environment. Very quickly, here's a video of the famous Joseph Jaffe interviewing 
if I can find it. Interviewing the product manager of one of these brands. I'm going to see Doug from Aria. Now, you selected Vanguard for your startup pilot program. Why them? So, for Aria, we really want to take all these kind of very well integrated systems So you'll notice, <coughs> excuse me. So you'll notice there are a number of terms that the marketing manager started using, and make him sound far more far more like a techie. He's using very much lean startup terminology, pivoting. We're going to um, operate like a startup. We're going to be more lean and nimble. We're going to get things to market quicker. So it's starting to happen where large marketing, well, large marketing organisations and their marketers are having to start thinking in slightly different ways. The next point is as you know, the exposure. So here on, on Hall's product, there are four senior marketing people that would have been exposed to this, that are now being exposed to how to start operating like a startup. Very, it's a very good training operation to get your, your people internally to be, you know, to, to be exposed to, to something slightly different. Um, and you know, we've heard about Lean Startup in the last couple of days. I'm gonna to touch on it again uh, later in this presentation. But you know, if, it, if it's going all the way up to a product manager at Oreo, there's got to be something there. So here we know is Nike, a fantastic um, sh shoe uh, company of 20 years ago, but now really is a fitness and exercise uh, organization. And the goal that they had um, was to launch something called the Nike Accelerator, which was this program uh, which would take the data from all of these uh, devices. So there's the Nike Fuel Band, which you can get fuel, there's Nike Plus, which is the chip in the running shoe. Um, and all of these um, applications so collect data. And what they then did is they took, our, took their um, development program, similar to Mobile Futures, and they said that they are looking for um, innovators to, to take, make advantage of that data. They had 8,000 pitches in a three-month process, and then there were 10 that were selected on the final day. Just to note that all of these are not just a you know, couple of days. The people go through lots of uh, evaluation. It's not just Nike doing it. They have a whole lot of startup um, incubators and um, uh, organizations that help them manage this process, as did Mondelez. Um, Mondelez also, it was a three-month pro uh, project that you had to get something to market within that three months to be able to, to qualify. So the Nike Accelerator was launched. They were looking for 10 companies in a three-month period, and they would put $20,000 into it. And each of those companies could then benefit from access to that data and also be you know, part of, of winning the, the Nike Accelerator program. So one of the great examples was this product called FitDeck. It is a 52-card uh, playing uh, uh, deck of cards, and there are 40 different uh, varieties. So if you're a triathlete, you, there's a special deck for you. If you're a pregnant mom, there's a special deck for you. If you are an elderly person suffering from diabetes, there's a special deck for you. So that is what they developed as from one of these, um, uh, one of these uh, accelerator winners. And what then happens is that as you use the, um, this program, your Nike Fuel Band or a Nike Plus accelerometer measures and, and uh, um, accumulates the points 
that you are uh, earning for doing it and adds it to your overall Nike points. And so doing, closing the loop between the exercise that you do and adding back into the Nike Accelerator um, or, um, program in terms of, of collecting um, points. Very, very good. There are 10, there are nine other startups that, that succeeded in this program. But you can see what these organizations are doing. They're making their financial um, clout available and they're putting resources behind innovating. They're not expecting to innovate from within, within. They're putting their assets on the line. The next and also very excitable area in terms of innovation is what we're calling the programmable enterprise. And this is where you are starting to expose your physical and digital assets through APIs that allow entrepreneurs and, and developers to add value. So you know, innovation is happening everywhere and it makes sense to allow that innovation to happen around your data and around your assets. Um, and one of the fantastic uh, comments that came out of, of Mobile World Congress this year from um, uh, Mitch Kapoor, who's the CEO of Apogee, he said, the old approach was to look inside or outside of the business. But with now how the lines are blurring between inside and outside, you don't know where that edge is. So rather expose your, your physical assets and your digital assets to the market and allow the innovation to take place without you having to get too involved. Does anyone know who Walgreens are, what, what they do? Are, uh, anyone? Yep. Pharmacy. Great pharmacy. So they are a really nice equivalent of Dischem. Um, are there any Dischem people in the crowd? So they are um, a great um, uh, pharmacy chain in the, in the States. 8,000 stores, 6, daily, uh, 6 million daily customers. A script is uh, filled every second. And they have 99% of those stores have a photo lab within them. That's what a typical Walgreens look like. Very nice little store. Um, and what they realized was they have got 8,000 stores around the country in the States. And they have spent a huge amount of money in investing photo labs in each of these stores. That funny little guy who sits in the corner, looks through all your pictures, hoping to find a pervy one that he can make a copy of. And uh, you know, that's money that, that they've invested. But what they've also done is they've invested a huge amount of money in developing the APIs to allow you to print from walgreens.com. So you upload your photos from your phone or your camera. You say, print to, to Walgreens, and you can go and collect your photos at Walgreens the next day, or they can be delivered to you. And what they did was they said, well, let's make those, let's expose that API, that photo printing API, as a uh, photo printing service as an API to developers. And they created the Walgreens photo app, and this is an example that you can now print to Walgreens from Instagram. So overnight, they added 100 million customers to Instagram, the ability to print to Walgreens. There was um, an immediate um, uh, benefit because the developer of these products get a, gets a revenue share. So whether it's a, an Instagram um, or a, um, a much smaller uh, uh, specialist photography app or uh, a friend, um, a family and friends app, you can now print from that directly to Walgreens. And this kind of thing has changed the way that, that businesses operate. Now, Walgreens has got developers as their customers. Imagine in this country having Dischem that had a developer program. It's quite far out there. We're not ready yet, but this is some exciting stuff here. If we can get our large companies to follow this approach, we really are going to be onto something. So I know that the um, Nedbank has got the, uh, um, the program at the moment to develop retail apps, which Roland discussed with you um, earlier in the conference. Very similar but this is far more structured and far more long-lasting than just a single competition. So look for how you and your customers can expose your data, both physical, uh, so your, your assets, both phys physical and digital, uh, as APIs. The mobile industry is also starting to play in this, in this environment. Um, they are exposing APIs uh, to or their messaging data and location data and authentication, um, all to, uh, through APIs, which is, which is quite exciting. Um, likes of Orange, Vodafone, AT&T, Telefonica have all signed up for this. So developers are going to start being able to get access to that data for their apps. The next big thing around, around innovation is around making that data open. Um, and specifically, I'm here, I'm talking about um, municipalities and governments. Um, the governments have realized that they have lots of data and they also they actually don't know what to do with it, that they're not the cleverest people in the room. 
So there are a couple of great examples of how this has been made open through uh, programs like Open Cities, um, which has taken data from Barcelona, uh, Antwerp, Amsterdam, Rome, Paris, um, and Bologna, Bologna uh, and Berlin, and have asked people to create apps with that data. So the data that they've made available stretches across a whole lot of different things. So election data, demographics, labor force, traffic, crime, um, number of businesses opening, construction sites that are being built, applications for license, business licenses, all that stuff has been made public, and now developers can start adding value to it by combining, for example, the weather data with crime data, for example. Something that the, 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 the um, police would never actually get to themselves, but you know, they could certainly uh, use a whole lot of smart developers uh, to, to get there. And if you look at why people want access to this data, they're all looking to try and um, stimulate the economy in those, in those cities. They're trying to encourage transparency. They're trying to develop innovation. So imagine if we could get within the sort of tech and Brahm environment in, in Johannesburg, um, or one of the innovation hubs in, um, San, in, in, uh, in Pretoria, if we were able to uh, have this data available uh, from the crime stats and the weather and traffic and all those things, put it together and start helping the city improve themselves. There are a couple of others. There's datacatalogs.org, um, which is also a very exciting um, uh, set, a data set which you can have a look at. I'm getting the five minute, not even, I'm getting the two minute warning. I'm not gonna go into lean in too much detail. You guys have all seen this, but you know, we know that things have, have never moved this quickly and are never gonna move this slowly again and it really is an opportunity to, to innovate quickly. Do yourself a favor, go and look on the internet for this video from Todd Park. He is the CTO of America. He is the CTO in Barack Obama's uh, business, and he is really pushing innovation and lean startup thinking. So go and have a look at this. It's from the Lean Startup Conference last year at, in San Francisco. It's outstanding. It really is what we need in, in this country as well. Um, we know that in terms of lean startup, I'm not going to go into too detail, but in the times of increasing uncertainty, we need to iterate, we need to think like startups, um, and we've got to be agile, because we know that we have to be doing the right thing right, as opposed to doing the thing that is utterly flawed perfectly. Um, we've heard about build, measure, learn, and iteration around this, and getting that minimum viable product out. Um, and a great example in, in this country was CarFind when they launched. All they launched was with an email uh, link on their website in sort of the late um, 90s, and that has now spawned what CarFind is today. So in summary, we've got to start looking at, at how to innovate in, in large organizations um, in, in ways that we've never done before. Don't be scared to bring other you know, external people in. Don't be scared to put some of your assets on the line, whether it's, whether it's digital or physical, and make sure that um, you, you, know, you, you help teach the people in your organization how to think like startups. And final, final thought, uh, Peggy Johnson from Qualcomm says, she's not gonna predict what the next, what's gonna happen in the next 10 years, but she knows that it is gonna be magical. And I think that we all have the opportunity to be part of that magic in the next 10 years. And that's me. You had unlimited cash, right? And you had a government that was willing. What would you do? I would say, what are our four or five biggest challenges as, an, as a, as a country, I'd probably go education, crime, service delivery, job creation, and probably health. Yeah. And I'd see what data is available uh, in, those, in each of those sectors, and I'd put together the best team to help get that data you know, in a presentable format that peop we could innovate against. Yeah. Um, because you know, we know that they are unable to roll out complex technical projects, um, and there's a lot of smart people in rooms like this that need that opportunity to do it. And you know, both from a, from a um, financial reward perspective, but also from actually m trying to make a difference in this country. I think that there's so many stillborn initiatives and things that have been st stop start um, that, you know, th that we can innovate in a far better way if it isn't all closed and, and, uh, and, uh, and we don't have access to it. In that Todd Park video, what he says is, um, the weather data that the US Weather Service has collected and the GPS data that the military created, the taxpayers paid for that, that data. And it was sacrilege if it was never made open. Yep. The fact that it was made open added you know, 100, just the weather data 
and that GPS data at $100 billion in last, to last uh, year's GDP in the States yep. um, because that data was open. Yeah, thanks. No, so I think, so the question is how do we go about actually getting the, the, the government to, to do this kind of thing? I think we've got to prove it, we've got to prove it works. So I would go to a, a willing municipality um, that has access to uh, traffic information, crime stats, all that, that kind of stuff. Um, so you find a, a mayor or a mayoral committee that is willing to, to trial something and we prove that it works on a small scale, take that as the example to a larger, uh, to Trevor Manuel of the NB, uh, National Planning Department, or to um, GCIS, or to any of the, the other um, government departments that would be able to take it further. But I think we've got to prove it. We've got to take the lean approach to getting this thing out. Any other questions? Cool, done. Cool. Drive safely in the rain, guys. No, but have drinks first. Yeah.